Hello, I'm Randall Fields. I'm the chairman of the Sons of Herman Hall Historical Committee. We've been working on our centennial celebration since April of 2010. We'd like to start here and show you our historic exhibit room today. The Sons of Herman's Hall is a colorful organization that's now occupied by Columbia Lodge 66 and Dallas Lodge 22. I'm holding our 100 year old deed for the property. We have other items we're gonna be showing you today. In 1910, there were four lodges here in the Dallas American community. Those lodges pooled their money and bought the property that this building is built on. Uh, as much out of a necessity for unity as, a, as the necessity for having a convenient meeting hall. Uh, these articles covers the history of the hall and the German American community going back to 1840 to 1890 and on into earlier times of the 1900s with German American life, German community life, and then the actual establishing of the hall itself. Well, my name is uh, Glenn Marvin, current president of Columbia Lodge 66. We were chartered in 1893, and this is our exhibit in our ex this exposition hall. And this is our current fl our flag that we uh, had built. And if you come and look real close, you can find the one flaw in there. And these are some of the things, pictures from our past, and. Uh, our Oktoberfest, our representation out at the State Fair of Texas, we used to have every year. And we have some of our old bowling equipment from back when we used to have our active bowling alley in the back. And uh, have pictures of our youth group up, uh, different picnics, uh, luau's. We've had a real fun time here with the lodge. And I'm very proud to be the president of uh, Columbia Lodge 66 and hope everybody comes down and becomes part of it. Hello, I'm David Lewis. I'm a member of Columbia Lodge 66. I'm gonna speak for Andy Schellenberg, who is the president of Lodge 22, who could not be here today. So I'm gonna read some of this uh, uh, just to be sure that I get it right. Uh, but Lodge 22, Euland Lodge 22, was founded on 11-3-1890. It was an all-males lodge. Uh, Fortuna Lodge 119 merged with them in 1921. It was also a male a men's lodge. Germania Lodge Number no. 5 was founded in, 19, in 1896 and it was an all-females lodge. It merged with Euland Lodge 22 in 1976, January 1 of 1976. And at that time they changed the name to Dallas Lodge 22, which is what the name of that lodge is today. This is their booth here in our, in our exhibit room, uh, displaying some of their, their charter, uh, some uh, photography uh, from over the years, some plaques, some uh, historical things, as well as some newspaper articles. Uh, some of the things Andy wanted, uh, wanted us to talk about, of course, everybody knows we're celebrating a centennial anniversary here, the 100 year anniversary of the hall. Um, you know, they, as a lodge, have enjoyed, many of their members are actually fourth and fifth generation members going, or third and fourth generation members going all the way back to the founding of this building, the building of this building. Uh, and of course, there's been bowling, billiards, uh, bingo, shuffleboard, many different activities that they've uh, been a part of over the hall. They're proud to say that they also give scholarships uh, in the neighborhood to colleges and tech schools and uh, have seen many people go on to graduate high school, local high schools high school seniors going to graduate from college here in the area. They also give a donation to the Grand Lodge, the retirement home, in memory of deceased members. And uh, anyway, that's, uh, they do have three Sons of Herman uh, agents as well that sell life insurance, which of course, for those of you who don't know, is how you become a member. So that's in a nutshell for Lodge 22. Hi, David Lewis here. I'm gonna speak to uh, the bowling part of our organization here, Dallas Sons of Herman Hall. Um, we, I have not actively bowled in quite some time, but uh, I'm gonna speak for some of the bowlers who, who have, uh, who are very active in it and have bowled. Uh, they used to bowl here at the Sons of Herman Hall from about 1916 to 19, to the, to the mid 60s, sometime in the 60s. We actually have a bowling alley in the back of this building. Uh, this building was first, uh, well, the, the land was sold by the Bernier family who lived in a butcher shop in the back that fronts Main Street. That building is still there. They sold the front plot of land here, which is the hall itself, which we're standing in, in the famous Sons of Herman ballroom above us. They joined the buildings. First, they put a staircase addition in, 
And then they joined the butcher shop, which was their building at the time, to this ballroom with uh, a bowling alley. Bowling alley has always been very big with Sons of Herman, and uh, and they bowled here. Like I say, you, you can see here, um, they were having events here back in 1917. Um, there were grudge matches here between Houston and Dallas, uh, dating back from 1948 uh, through the 70s. They quit bowling here, obviously, you ask where those tournaments were held if, if they quit bowling in the back in the 60s, but they would bowl at some of the, uh, the mega bowling centers here around town. You can see a number of our trophies here, and again, pictures and plaques of, of match games between Dallas and Houston. Again, that was a very, very big thing was these Dallas and Houston, uh, Houston grudge matches. Uh, it's been a... It's been a uh, a long time since people have bowled here and people often ask if we're ever going to restore the bowling alley. We actually did. Uh, it was covered with white tile. vinyl tile <laughs> and uh, we uncovered those lanes back in uh, 2002 and restored them cosmetically, uh, not functionally, uh, in order to show what that room really was. And that's actually a favorite room now because of its appearance. When people go back there and, and they walk into this building and think, that people were bowling back there all the way back, you know, in in the in the teens of the 1900s. Uh, that was a real project, a labor of love. We found some time capsules in there where the uh, where the chalk pedestals had been, and we found the old um, uh, gutters, pieces of they were above uh, above lane gutters, and kids, uh, members of. Uh, uh, Sons of Herman members who had parents who bowled would be what we call the pin jockeys and they would sit on saddles on stoops between the lanes and they would uh, as soon as the balls knocked the pins down they would jump off of the the stoops roll the ball back again an above ground gutter uh, move the pins out of the way and then try to get out of the way before the next ball came down and I do have friends who are my age who as children uh, did set pins uh, James Dunham particularly who's been uh, one of the uh, past presidents of our lodge, Columbia Lodge 66. So that's a uh, that's a big history uh, of uh, of bowling uh, that we have here, and and uh, uh, we probably would never go back to actually bowling back there, but it is still pretty neat to go back there and see that room, and we do. Uh, still actively have people who bowl in the Sons of Herman, just not here. They have leagues that they've combined with other people around town. And this right here is pretty neat. This is a bowling ball that um, the people who uh, we hired to help us with the the, bowl, the restoration of the bowling alley uh, happened to be very, very old guys. It's kind of a funny story. When we decided to do it, you know, we had to look, there were holes in three of the lanes, big, big holes in three of the lanes. And so we had to uh, find some uh, replacement uh, sections for those lanes. Uh, there's the header, which is the part where you, uh, or the approach, the part where you walk up to, to throw the ball. And then the first 16 or so feet of the lane is the header. And we had to find those parts for three of these lanes. And, and I found those out in West Texas. Um, but then uh, through, uh, I guess, networking, was able to find an old guy west of Fort Worth who, uh, when I called him, he said he wasn't sure if he could do this because he'd been on the road working on a bowling alley in Arizona and another one in Seattle, Washington, I think. And he'd just gotten back and his wife had said, uh, you need to get out there and sow the, plow, the, uh, sow the South 40. <laughs> and, I mean, literally that's what he said. So he actually had a farm here west of Fort Worth. But he said he, he sent his partner in here and he did send his partner in here and, uh, and they agreed that they would come out and work on our bowling alleys and help put all these parts back in, all these uh, replacement lanes back in, so forth and so on. And uh, they saw what a labor of love this was for us to have actually uncovered these lanes to see what had been covered up by so many of us from back in the 60s. I started coming here in 82, and so I didn't know, you know, really what was gonna be under there, but they realized how, how big a deal this was to us. They happened to have done this work since they were kids. Uh, again, you know, they were probably, they were in their 70s, and uh, they had been, he said they had been in every Sons of Herman bowling alley in Texas. And there are quite a few of them. The Grand Lodge in San Antonio, the original lodge, has, uh, uh, has I, I can't remember how many lanes, but it's still operational. So he, upon finishing the job, went through an old shed and found some stuff that he had, uh, that he had gathered over the years in different bowling alleys throughout Texas. And this, this little small ball was one that he found 
and it was kind of ironic because when he handed it to me, and he didn't realize this, but you know, a lot of people have their name or their initials engraved on the uh, on the ball, and the initials on this were DL, and you know, that's my name, David Lewis. So that was kind of special because this was a pretty big project to me. So, uh, and and of course, to those people who were lucky enough to bowl. Over the many years here, it was very big. There was actually a rumor that Don Carter, uh, during tournaments, would come here and uh, and practice, and because he could get away from the public and do that do that in uh, in uh, obscurity, if you will. I have tried to call him. I've got a hold of his sister-in-law before, but never could get a return call, whether that was an actual fact or not. Um, See, there was one other thing I wanted to point out. Oh, yeah, we, uh, when we did uncover the lanes, we had lane one, the far left lane, was intact. <clears throat> Though I would say it was somewhat of a roller coaster because it had been covered for so many years, not leveled and so forth and so on. So one night, uh, one Saturday night, I think after we, um, after we had shut down the bar, we went downstairs and, and I, we did find a couple of bowling balls underneath the, uh, underneath the lanes. And uh, there was about six or seven of us bartenders and staff that were staying late and we decided to bowl. And I was the last one to stand up there and bowl and I did get the first strike on the newly uncovered lane. So <laughs> that was pretty funny. But anyway, that's a little bit of the storied uh, past of our bowling uh, organization here within the Sons of Herman Hall. So thank you very much. Okay, I'm gonna give a brief history of golf here. Um, speaking for Bobby and Oscar, who their granddaughter is having an 18th birthday party today and say that they weren't able to be here and tell you this. They could speak more to this than I can, but I can tell you that it was formed in 1972, the year I graduated from college, excuse me, from high school, and uh, has been going strong ever since. They keep threatening uh, to disband the golf tournament, uh, or excuse me, the golf association, which goes, I believe, from, well, it goes, I guess, from February or so uh, till, till December. They have the uh, banquet every year here in December at the Sons of Herman Hall, uh, the awards banquet. It was founded by Larry Wishard uh, and uh, revived by Oscar and Bobby Oswalt uh, uh, later in the 90s. Um, they are, uh, heralded for doing a Brian's House charity golf tournament in July of every year. And you'll notice here, here is a, uh, a figure, and I, th I think this is higher now after this year's tournament, but that says that to date we've, um, they have raised $85,075. And again, I'm pretty sure that that has, uh, that, that has reached higher this year uh, with the 2011 tournament. It's a lot of fun. I, I was lucky enough to do this a couple of years. A great group of guys who go out and golf every year, uh, guys and gals, excuse me. Uh, and we go to, they go to, uh, to courses all over North Texas. Bobby and Oscar, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, just last week or the weekend before, went, to, went down to the Grand Lodge to San Antonio to golf in a charity golf tournament down there and had a lot of fun. Um, they, uh, some of our golfers, especially Bobby and Double O, try to go and support them down there in their endeavors with golf because they do a lot of charity work. And then the Grand Lodge comes up and they will uh, golf with us at our Brian's House tournament every year uh, and usually make a healthy donation as well. So that is very much appreciated. Brian's House, of course, uh, is a chill, is a, uh, is a uh, home for children with AIDS, and so it's a very good cause, and everybody's very proud that this golf tournament has done that for so many years. So um, anyway, any of you who see this and are golfers and want to, you don't have to be a member of the Sons of Herman to golf. It is sponsored by the Sons of Herman Golf Association, uh, but we'd love to see you become a member of the Sons of Herman and then maybe become a member of the Golf Association to ensure that this uh, keeps going for a while, so it takes people to keep it going, and hopefully, uh, we'll keep going for quite some time. So this this award right here is a humanitarian award. The uh, Grand Lodge asks every lodge within the state to uh, to pick a humanitarian within your organization. And in this year, 2001, the award went to the Golf Association for the work they do for Brian's House. So. Right, I'm going to speak now a little bit about the Sons of Herman Youth Group. Unfortunately, I'm not an expert here, but I can talk a little bit about it. First, the Grand Lodge uh, has supported the youth activities. Uh, I believe they formed their, they have a youth camp, and I believe, and that's in Bandera, Texas, um, or Medina, excuse me, actually, um, just down the road. But it was, I believe, formed in 1954, the year I was born. 
Uh, so they have been supporting youth group activities for quite some time, and as many of the lodges within uh, the Sons of Herman uh, organization do as well. I think we've got still 141 lodges in, in Texas. Uh, that may be plus or minus a little bit now, but uh, we've actually had, I, I did have a friend of ours who was on the board with us, who was uh, for a number of years, Elsie Nelson, who in 2001 when we did the uh, the 90th anniversary, uh, the president of the Grand Lodge came up and we all went down the street. There was uh, a, a whole bunch of us who went down the street and had dinner and she was sitting next to Leroy and they got to talking and she actually went to uh, the youth camp the very first year that it opened and Leroy thought that that was, he had a lot of fun with that, you know. Uh, sadly, Elsie has passed on now, but uh, she was very active in this. Uh, Bobby, you keep hearing Bobby and Bobby Oswald's name a lot. She's been very active in this. They had a dance group for years, back started back in the 90s, called the Dallas Dazzlers. Uh, Bobby's got, I won't even try to count how many kids and grandkids that, uh, and I suppose great grandkids now, that uh, are, are here who have, uh, of course, their parents or their grandparents have brought them into the fold as member as young members and you'll see pictures of them the reason you heard me say a minute ago i think that uh, that one of their uh, grand one of her granddaughters olivia is having an 18th birthday party so that's why they're not here to speak to this and, and give you a better presentation but uh, uh, a lot of our friends have had uh, uh, have been a part of this i was Lucky enough to have helped with this a little bit back in the 90s. We used to take the kids to the Ranger games. I was uh, That was always a lot of fun uh, as a baseball fan, uh, but I did do it for the for the youth group, not because I was a baseball fan. But um, it's, it's, been a, it's been a good thing because I think it, uh, it helps instill in those children, in those kids, uh, part of being an organization, part of working together. They actually do have meetings just like the grown-ups do. Uh, they have an agenda in their meetings. They are very philanthropic, if you will. Uh, that's probably not the right word, but they, they do a lot of community service. They, at Christmas time, they will uh, take uh, blankets to uh, senior citizens' homes. They've taken coats, they've done coat drives, taken those to sen senior citizen homes. They um, have at times managed the food drives that we do every year. Uh, they've managed the book drives. Uh, they just had their second annual retreat where they went to Six Flags and they, they uh, went along with their chaperone, uh, had a, uh, a hotel for the weekend where they did some planning for the upcoming year. Uh, so we're really proud of them. They, they are very responsible. They take an active role. Um, they'll often come into our meetings and uh, give a presentation on what they're doing. They've, uh, at Christmas parties, they'll often do skits, uh, plays upstairs on the, on the stage. So we're really proud of them and uh, hope that that will continue into the future as well so that we will, because uh, they are our future, you know, so that's pretty important. So thank you. Yeah, speaking again to uh, what is readily obvious to most who see this sign here, American Idol actually had their first audition here and the first winner actually came through the Sons of Herman Hall, uh, a local uh, production company, if you will, or, or uh, uh, you know, a scout, scouting locations for American Idol, had done some videos here of commercials and such. So he came out and took some pictures, sent it back to Hollywood, and they liked what they saw, and so they decided to shoot the uh, city of Dallas's uh, finals, if you will, here at Dallas. As you know, they travel all over the country, different sites, at least they did at the time. This was the first year. Uh, so they had what they, I think they called the cattle call down the street at the Fairmont or the Hyatt Regency or something. And then they brought the people that, uh, that they filtered through that to here. And it was a pretty neat, uh, a pretty neat deal. They uh, had a bunch of equipment in here and actually hired security guards for the front and back. and. And uh, I got here about six o'clock in the morning and kids were already lined up uh, outside the building. Some of them were leaning against the floor sleeping, uh, against the building sleeping. Others were sitting there practicing their voice, you know, those the vocal exercises and so forth. Uh, people started coming in, you know, the production people started coming in about eight o'clock or so. Um, and I remember seeing, I see it's Paul Abdul, Randy Jackson and Simon Cowell, I guess is his name. 
so when Simon walked in, uh, you know, I was really, I didn't know who this guy was, but he was very prim and very proper, wearing those English pointy boots, you know, that you zip up on the side, very tight black slacks and a, a white, you know, button down shirt and this really tight vest and, you know, I mean, really prim and proper. And he made his way through the building and again, it's about 8.30 in the morning or something and, and he walks back to me, I'm standing in the kitchen, he wanted to know if I could make him a cup of tea. And I said, sure, and I went to the coffee pot and uh, the coffee pot had some stains in it, you know, I mean, it was clean, but it was coffee stained and he, he wouldn't have anything to do with that. And uh, he said, can you just microwave me a, a, cup of, uh, a cup of hot water? And I did. And I said, but I don't have any tea. I'm, I, and he pulls out his wallet and opens his wallet and he pulls the tea bag out of his wallet. So there's a little Simon Cowell story. But it was very interesting. They, uh, you know, they, they ran people, uh, they had them lined up. They had wardrobe in here. They had them all sitting in the back and they would call their name and they would come through and they would have cameras at various locations and they would film them. And then this particular emblem here was the spot that they used upstairs. The people would, uh, the, the contestants uh, would come up and they would stand on that spot. Uh, for the benefit of the, the cameras to be sure that they had them in the same place every time. The, uh, the panel, the judges sat at the front of the building here upstairs right in front of the stage. And I hope I can say this, but one of the neat things at the time was that there was a, a producer that sat over here to the left. So you had the, the judges up here, the contestants stopping on this mark in the middle of the ballroom upstairs and this, and this producer over here. And there were a few times that uh, you saw the panel, the, the judges would look over at that producer and he would give them a thumbs up or a thumb down. And that was how they decided, you know, that these guys were gonna go to the next step, which was Hollywood. I don't know if they still do that and I hope I don't get in trouble. I hope they still come back and, and rent the hall another time in the future. But uh, at the end of the show, we asked the producers if we could have this and sure enough, it was like the last thing there. They had gotten all the camera equipment and one of them came and I said, man, you know, we sure would like that as, as a memento. So uh, I think we've got the date maybe written on the back or something that says, uh, you know, what that was all about. So, but again, Kelly Clarkson, you might remember, was the first uh, 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 American Idol winner and she came through here. She actually came through here. Another little story since we're telling these stories. Uh, I, I work at a, a soap company, a, a chemical specialties company, and there was an old guy there that had been there for years and years and years, and I told him about this and, and said that we'd like to kind of do some things, polish some uh, brass work and clean the ballroom floor up there, make it real shiny. So we got one of our products that we sold at the time, and we came up here the week before, or earlier that week, and we were on our hands and knees for two nights in a row with, with knives using this, use, using this floor polish and then buffing it out. Well, it made it look really, really pretty, but it also made it look very, very slick. And there was one contestant who came up, she was a long, beautiful girl, with this nice, beautiful, long, slinky dress, and she, she stood there on her mark and she sang, and of course everything was a cappella. And so um, the judges said, no, 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 they kind of balked a little bit, and then, um, they said, okay, give us another, another verse. And she gave, her, gave another verse and they said, okay, you're going. And so she, she was just all, you know, she just so excited, so excited. She ran up to the judge's table. Of course, there was a curtain around the table and she got to the judge's table and wearing her heels, she tried to stop. Well, she didn't stop very well. The floor was so slippery from the work we had done on it earlier in the week that her feet just went out from under, her legs went under the table. <laughs> And of course, everybody got up to see if she was okay. Paula later came down and hugged her downstairs. But the guy, uh, the guy at work, he worked in our customer service department at the time uh, with a bunch of other folks. And so uh, when that show aired, when the premiere aired later on, uh, he got to tell all the girls in customer service that he worked with that, that he was responsible for that. And so it was pretty neat. So we're pretty proud of that. That was a lot of fun. Uh, it gave us a good reputation. We had a, a American Idol watching party when that, when that aired. So anyway, there you go, a little bit of history. Uh, this is a collection of uh, things that I have collected uh, over the many years. Like I say, we found out about this place in 1982. So I've uh, fell in love with it like so many other people have and immediately started collecting things. Um, I've got a collection of, I think there's only about three or four t-shirts that I couldn't find. I've got them somewhere. I wish I uh, had them in this case as well, but I've got 
almost every t-shirt that's ever been uh, put on, uh, put together since I started coming here that I know of, uh, Sons of Herman t-shirts, not band t-shirts obviously, uh, included, we just talked about American Idol. Uh, the original, the first t-shirts I ever saw here it was about 1984, I think, and it was the Songwriter Sanctuary, which was a, uh, a little, uh, the original picking circle before Ranger Randall started the, uh, or not the picking circle, but uh, uh, an open mic, if you will, uh, although seldom mic'd, uh, usually acoustic, but uh, before Randall started his campfire sessions here, that was uh, something that Bob Hardy had started doing here way back when. And then I've got a lot of memorabilia here that uh, I've collected as well over the years um, uh, in various forms or fashions given to me by some of the older members back then who I'm coming up if not already past the age that they were at the time when I started coming here as a wee pup. But um, um, you know we've got a uh, 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 an original policy here from what year is this? 1953, the year before I was born. Um, and it was given to some uh, German, uh, a German man there, you can see. Um, some brooches and pins that I've been lucky enough to purchase online or like I say, have been handed down to, to me from various members. Um, it's, it's been a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of fun collecting this stuff, a lot of friends, uh, they know that I like to collect this stuff and will every now and then come and give me something. Uh, I've been lucky enough, I guess 30 years, almost 30 years, 29 years I've been coming here, so, and this place has been 100, so I'm just shy of, what, 30%? Uh, you know, in 1984, I was a disc jockey at Kano and Radio here in Dallas. I was introduced to the Sons of Herman's Hall through Jim Brisson, the singing tree man, who was a partner with Bob Hardy, who was producing the Songwriter Sanctuary here at the Sons of Herman's Hall. They ran that event for about three years, and in uh, October of 1985, I guess it was, Kano Inn and Sons of Herman's Hall started a long-lasting partnership when I produced a, ser a series of shows called the Texas Music Celebration. The first show featured Robert Earl Keene Jr. here at the Sons of Herman's Hall. Over the years, myself, uh, a man named Mike Snyder, Joe Nicodemus, uh, who is their current uh, president of the board here at the Sons of Herman's Hall, along with others like uh, Bob, I uh, Bob Sullivan, John Iskander, uh, Dan Chandler. Uh, they're just some of the past promoters who have done shows here at the Sons of Herman's Hall. But the Sons of Herman Hall here in Dallas has a long history of music, movie, television, and video production, and this wall represents that. In 1994, after 10 years or so of doing live music promotions here in the ballroom at Sons of Herman's Hall, we started this Electric Campfire Acoustic Jam. It's an event that's been happening every Thursday night since 1994. This is, a, is an event that's, that has gone on unbroken and has welcomed many pickers into the uh, famous Sons of Herman's Hall, people who have gone on to start their own bands, and this is just one of our very favorite events here at, at the Sons of Herman's Hall. This past August the 13th of 2011 was our fifth annual Sunstock event. We started this event in 2007 to represent the Woodstock Music and Arts Gathering. We've had live music and artisan and vendors in the building uh, since then. It's been another favorite event at the Sons of Herman's Hall. Another favorite and popular event here at the Sons of Herman Hall is our swing dance. This started in 1996 when John McDonnell, who we know as J-Mac, along with a band called Kim Lentz and the Rockabilly Band, and her Rockabilly Band, started offering swing dance lessons. It's now a three-night event at the Sons of Herman Hall. Every uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday nights, you can come down for some swing dance lessons, hear some swing music, and enjoy that part of this hall too.